What's going on, y'all? What do promoters and talent buyers and agents, what do they look for in an email? When you're pitching yourself, what should that email look like? So this is a little bit of a longer clip. This is from my podcast interview with Micah Davidson. Just a good old dialogue on promoters and agents, what we look for in bands, what emails should look like, and much, much more. So I hope you enjoy this clip from podcast episode number 102. And take a quick second, subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. I'll make sure to answer questions for you. And enjoy this clip with the amazing Micah Davidson. Live the life you love. Really enjoy the music and you've seen growth in those, I always say like focus on eight to 10 markets when you're first starting out, build those markets. You want to be able to sell out the two to 400 person venue in your hometown. Right. Then be able to sell another 100 to 200 tickets in those eight markets around you. And if you can even do that, like even if it's not $100,000 yet, um, that'll get most agents' attention. And especially if your music's really good, because um, then they see like there's a good, solid foundation there. It's something that you can build off of, especially if you've been doing it for, for two years. Correct. That's great to have. Um, yeah. When they reach out to you from an agent side and a buyer side, what should that email look like? Like what are some email pet peeves? Like what gets an automatic delete? Um, I'm sure someone writes you a novel, <laughs> you don't have time to read those. Well, see. So again, for me, I try to answer every single email. So nobody gets an automatic delete. Um, however, there are certain ones that will certainly get buried in my inbox and I will, I will unfortunately not get back to you until later. Um, uh, and those are going to be the ones that are basically just like you mentioned, there's, they're sending a novel, you know, I, what I need is a, a, I would say that much text, if you will, um, if that works, you know, since this is a video podcast as well, I, I would say about that much text is, is, is what you need to grab me with. And then for audio, so, about a, a, a paragraph and a half, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I would say, you know, send, send something that's got a picture, send something that's got some, some quick links to socials and, and maybe a couple of quotes, maybe, you know, maybe some stats about we've played these festivals and things like that. But to some extent, again, if I do my research properly, I'm going to look on your website and I'm going to figure out what are the, what are the places you're playing as a talent buyer, as an agent, either side of that, I'm going to look at your website and figure out what, how good does this website look? You know, is it easy to navigate? Does it have plenty of media on there? Does it have, um, does it have current contact information on there? Does it have actual dates on there for, for shows and not like, some kind of a random RSS feed or whatever they're calling them these days, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. I want to see actual, like a, a real professional website, you know, that, that's been made in this, this day and age that between Wix and Squarespace and all of that, they're easy to make for sure. So they don't have to be like, you don't have to drop thousands and thousands of dollars on it, but it should be okay. something that's truly functional. Right. You yeah. know? Um, but, but I would say like a quick, a, a quick paragraph tops. Um, you know, build what's called a pitch. You know, if you can't grab me in 30 seconds, you don't have me. Right. I love that. And then, um, so for example, I want to throw out there is, let's say there's a band in Orlando. Uh, they're based in Orlando. You have a venue in Tampa. So for mm -hmm. those that are not in Florida, that's about 70, 80 miles apart. If right. band can, let's say can sell 200 tickets in Orlando at the, the social or sound bar, and it's legit, they're actually really doing that. Uh, and now they want to expand into Tampa, but have never played Tampa before. What are some things that you want to look for and how does that band get a shot of actually playing the next town over so they can start building that uh, city? Well, exactly what you just said, though. The, the, all of that example that you just said is, is, is a lot of the things that I want to be looking for. You know, first off, do I think that they're good? You know, it, we'll talk about generalities first, then we'll talk about maybe specifics as far as venue specific. Um, you know, are they a good band? Do I think they make sense for whatever venue we may be talking about? Um, if they're actually drawing 200 tickets in, in Orlando, chances are that, you know, if you're drawing 30, 40 tickets in, in a particular market, chances are that's very much coming from your market. If you're drawing, you know, around 200 people, chances are your friends are talking to their friends who live within an hour or so away from, from them, as well as just in general online. So you're probably going to be able to get 30, 40 people who are going to come out to a show in my potential market, and I'm certainly going to take a chance on that. However, that has a lot to do with, again, then you start talking about one, uh, you know, is there an opportunity for you to open for someone, depending on the size of the venue? Do you make sense if you're drawing 200 people here, should you even go to Tampa and play a show on your own yet? If you've never played there, period, maybe, maybe not. 
you know, certainly find a small venue, but again, I would do your research on looking at those venues specifically and figuring out who else is playing there and who are the headliners who are playing there. And do you think you actually make sense at those particular venues? It's great that you want to play those venues. Everybody wants to play every venue, but be mindful of the fact that the reality is, is at the, at the start, the smaller the venues are, they're a little more usually genre specific. Mm -hmm. It's as, as those, as that funnel gets smaller and smaller to where you go to those arenas, you know, you can go to any 10,000 cap or higher arena and you're going to see heavy metal, pop, mm -hmm. country, you know, wrestling, whatever it may be, everything starts to, to funnel into those exact venues because those are the size of those venues. But, um, but the reality is, is that again, pay attention to what you're doing. If you're a rock band, don't be reaching out to the jazz club, things like that. Um, but I would be reaching out and again, use that small thing that says we're drawing here. So it makes sense here. But again, the venue I have, since you're using Tampa as an example, the venue I have in Tampa, the attic um, is a 133 cap room, but it's really geared more towards a high end underplay of a venue. So you've never played Tampa before you're drawing 200 people in Orlando size wise, you make sense. But the reality is, is that you don't truly make sense for the attic because the attic is usually $25 tickets on the low end and they can go all the way up to $150 on tickets. Right. So if you're not selling those kind of tickets, those kind of ticket prices and stuff like that, you don't make sense for that venue, small or not. Right. You know? So again, do your research. If it wasn't an open venue that, I mean, it's, say it's a 100, 200 cap venue that is a little more diverse in genres and usually has an eight to 12 hour ticket. But again, Ben has never played in Tampa before, um, at least not a venue, but let's say they have, just to get into the market, they maybe played a few house shows and they may have played at a coffee house uh, just to like, get in front of people and build some, some right. things. Uh, is that something that you would look at? As a Absolutely. First, first show? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and we would certainly, even in my little 133 cap room, we would look at them as a potential opener, depending on who the headliner is, you know? Um, but again, they still got to be willing to come for that support budget and stuff like yeah. that, obviously as well. But, um, you know, again, I think every band deserves a listen. They took the time to reach out. So again, I get emails all day long. So if it's that short paragraph where I can do a quick link that takes me over to your, if I can be reading my next email, and listening to your music at the same time very quickly, excuse me, then great. I now, you know, I can, I can be moving on. But if I got to read 18 letters, you know, or, or 18 pages of a letter, if you will, um, to get to the information I need, I'm certainly going to, it's going to be a while before I actually get back to you, mm -hmm. you know. What, uh, what kind of content do you like seeing in those, in those links that they send? Do you want, like, what type of YouTube videos do you want to see or what type of, um, I guess, streaming links you like seeing? Um, certainly your socials from a standpoint of Facebook, um, Instagram, Spotify, I want to look at your actual, um, uh, you know, your actual, uh, stream plays and things, which I'm, I got a question for you in reverse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm, this is a question I've got. Um, it kind of drives me nuts sometimes when a band is like, we have 2 million streams mm -hmm. like, well, okay. But you have, you have a hundred thousand you know, actual followers or even 10,000 actual followers. And you have one song that got, you know, a hundred thousand plays, another song that got 400,000 plays, one song that got, you know, 600,000 plays, whatever. And not to say that that's still not impressive that they're doing that. But if one song is from 2016, right. One song is from, you know, then, then what does that to, how does that 2 million actually affect me? You know, how do you justify saying that? I always look at how recent those releases were. So like if it's right. a release that was 2016 and has even say a million streams, but like right. the newest release that's 2020 only has 10,000 streams, then of course something happened there, right? Was that single with the million streams? Was that like something that went a little bit viral um, for, for some reason? Was there something going on in their career at that time? Like it has to be a reason why that drop is so big. Or is right. it music not as good was there maybe a change in band members and the main writer is no longer with the band and that's why the songs aren't as good anymore um right. definitely look at that if there's older songs that have more streams versus like newer songs that don't have as many right. definitely matters to me um that's that's like something i looked at a lot when i was at house of blues um yeah. like how long how long and how long has it been since you've released music 
Like if you all your music has 500 streams and up or 500,000 streams and up, but you haven't released anything in five years, like how relevant are those numbers still today? Um, exactly. And then one thing I always look at too is um, just because you have like a ton of followers or streams, like they could be anywhere in the world, right? It could be one stream in a hundred different cities or something. Um, what I always tell artists too, uh, and it'd be great to get your input on that as a, as a buyer, I tell them if you know, you have, say you have 100,000 followers and 20,000 of those are from Tampa or from a specific city you're trying to book, like send a screenshot of your analytics and show them, hey, here's a screenshot from my analytics. My analytics say there's X number of people in Tampa, Charlotte, whatever, and that's why I want to play the market. Right. I care more about that. I don't care as much because the the streaming play like of your song you could have paid money to get onto an aggregator you know right. which certainly still means that that, that song is getting played and it's getting out there but i want to see where your followers are i want to see what how many monthly listeners you have i want to see what markets and as a promoter i have a different login i think than than the general public and i can see um different information bands in town is another resource that i use quite a bit as a talent buyer you know because um, I have the ability to say, okay, if I'm going to run an ad through bands in town, how many people can I directly hit into their actual email? And if I put your band has, has never played in Tampa before, but I can put within, you know, 60 miles, how many people, how many fans do you have? And it looks like you have, you know, 140 fans Then I'm sending those exact people, those exact 140 fans an ad that says you're coming to play in the market that they live in, you know? Um, so I would say Facebook, some bands in town information, um, Instagram, I guess I'm old, which is why I keep looking at Facebook, I guess at at 40, almost 42 years old, that, that makes me old in this industry. Um, but, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Spotify, um, I absolutely look at Polestar. I use it as a grain of salt. You know, I'd look to see if you've got any analytics in there of, of any kind. Um, that's also a great resource to find out, you know, um, are, are you playing? And if you're playing, you know, are you, are you doing a big tour of your own, a headlining tour? Are you headlining, are you doing a big support tour, right. you know, and who are you supporting and how many of those support slots are you doing and how, how big is those, are those bands and so on. So I look at, I look at all of that stuff. YouTube. Um, I, I, I have certainly gotten more and more and more into YouTube um, over the past year or so in general. I don't use it to listen to music per se, like as a, as a media player, but I will go on there and look and see, you know, um, how do your videos look in general? Ideally, I'd, I would prefer to see live footage, but I don't want to see like a cell phone camera, so to speak. Um, you know, if it's professional grade cell phone camera, I guess I'd be more than happy to look at it. But for the most part, you know, I want the sound quality to be good and stuff so I can really get a sense of what you're doing. But then I also want to, I want to look at the views of that. You know, um, you know, do you have a video that's been, you know, a perfect example is uh, the Dead South, who were certainly a YouTube sensation um and thank god they were not like a justin bieber style youtube sensation i actually like their music but you know they came out of canada and they've got that one video that's got like 60 million views or something like that you know um and honestly like i liked them i didn't love them but then i finally got a chance to see them live and at that point that's when i was like all right now i truly get it you know um and the video that went viral was a music video it wasn't even a like a live footage video or anything like that you know so again it still didn't get i had to still do research to check out that band and you know to really get a sense of what what do they sound like live and such because you can produce an album or release an album but i find that 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 bands should almost never sound like they do on an album when they're playing live right um and i will say a big mistake that i'm sure you've come across is that a band will release um an album where it sounds like there's an 11 piece band on the album and they come and actually do the tour and they're touring in about the release of this album and they come as a three piece band. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I have a lot. Yeah.